Good evening. Tonight's story is The Injudicious Prayers of Pombo the Idolater by Lord Dunsany. This story was first published in Dunsany's Book of Wonder in 1918. It's a weird and intriguing story, beautifully written. So now, let's open our imaginations and begin. Pombo the idolater had prayed to Amuz a simple prayer, a necessary prayer, such as even an idol of ivory could very easily grant, and Amuz had not immediately granted it. Pombo had therefore prayed to Tharma for the overthrow of Amuz, an idol friendly to Tharma, and in doing this offended against the etiquette of the gods. Tharma refused to grant the little prayer. Pombo prayed it frantically to all the gods of idolatry, for, though it was a simple matter, yet it was very necessary to a man. And gods that were older than Amuz rejected the prayers of Pombo, and even gods that were younger, and therefore of greater repute. He prayed to them one by one, and they all refused to hear him, nor at first did he think at all of that subtle, divine etiquette against which he had offended. It occurred to him all at once, as he prayed to his fiftieth idol, a little green jade god whom the Chinese know, that all the idols were in league against him. When Pombo discovered this, he resented his birth bitterly, and made lamentation, and alleged that he was lost. He might have been seen then, in any part of London, haunting curiosity shops and places where they sold idols of ivory or of stone, for he dwelt in London with others of his race— although he was born in Burma, among those who hold the Ganges holy. On drizzly evenings of November's worst, his haggard face could be seen in the glow of some shop, pressed close against the glass, where he would supplicate some calm, cross-legged idol till policemen moved him on. And after closing hours back, he would go to his dingy room in that part of our capital where English is seldom spoken to supplicate little idols of his own. And when Pombo's simple, necessary prayer was equally refused by the idols of museums, auction rooms, shops, then he took counsel with himself and purchased incense and burned it in a brazier before his own cheap little idols and played the while upon an instrument such as that wherewith men charm snakes. And still the idols clung to their etiquette. Whether Pombo knew about this etiquette and considered it frivolous in the face of his need, or whether his need, now grown desperate, unhinged his mind, I know not, but Pombo the idolater took a stick and suddenly turned iconoclast. Pombo the iconoclast immediately left his house, leaving his idols to be swept away with the dust and so to mingle with man, and went to an arch-idolater of repute who carved idols out of rare stones and put his case before him. The arch-idolater who made idols of his own rebuked Pombo in the name of man for having broken his idols. For hath not man made them? the arch-idolater said. And, concerning the idols themselves, he spoke long and learnedly, explaining divine etiquette and how Pombo had offended and how no idol in the world would listen to Pombo's prayer. When Pombo heard this, he wept and made bitter outcry, and cursed the gods of ivory and the gods of jade, and the hand of man that made them. But most of all, he cursed their etiquette that he had undone, as he said, an innocent man. So that at last the arch-idolater, who made idols of his own, stopped in his work upon an idol of jasper for a king that was weary of Walsh, and took compassion on Pombo, and told him that although no idol in the world would listen to his prayer, yet only a little way over the edge of it a certain disreputable idol sat, who knew nothing of etiquette, and granted prayers that no respectable god would ever consent to hear. When Pombo heard this, he took two handfuls of the arch-idolater's beard and kissed them joyfully, and dried his tears and became his old impertinent self again. And he that carved from Jasper the usurper of Walsh explained how, in the village of World's End, at the furthest end of Last Street, there is a hole that you take to be a well close by the garden wall, but that if you lower yourself by your hands over the edge of the hole and feel about with your feet till they find a ledge, that 
is the top step of a flight of stairs that takes you down over the edge of the world. For all that men know, these stairs may have a purpose, and even a bottom step, said the arch-idolater. But discussion about the lower flights is idle. Then the teeth of Pombo chattered, for he feared the darkness. But he that made idols of his own explained that these stairs were always lit by the faint blue gloaming in which the world spins. Then, he said, you will go by Lonely House and under the bridge that leads from the house to nowhere and whose purpose is not guessed. Thence past Maharian, the god of flowers, and his high priest who is neither bird nor cat, and so you will come to the little idol Duth, the disreputable god that will grant your prayer. And he went on carving again at his idol of Jasper for the king who was weary of Wosh, and Pombo thanked him and went singing away, for in his vernacular mind he thought that he had the gods. It is a long journey from London to World's End, and Pombo had no money left, yet within five weeks he was strolling along Last Street, but how he contrived to get there I will not say, for it was not entirely honest. And Pombo found the well at the end of the garden, beyond the end house of Last Street, and many thoughts ran through his mind as he hung by his hands from the edge, but chiefest of all those thoughts was one that said the gods were laughing at him through the mouth of the arch-idolater, their prophet, and the thought beat in his head till it ached like his wrists, and then he found the step. And Pombo walked downstairs. There, sure enough, was the gloaming in which the world spins, and stars shone far off in it faintly. There was nothing before him as he went downstairs but that strange blue waste of gloaming with its multitudes of stars and comets plunging through it on outward journeys and comets returning home. And then he saw the lights of the bridge to nowhere, and all of a sudden he was in the glare of the shimmering parlor window of Lonely House, and he heard voices there pronouncing words, and the voices were nowise human, and, but for his bitter need, he had screamed and fled. Halfway between the voices and Maharian, whom he now saw standing out from the world, covered in rainbow halos, he perceived the weird gray beast that is neither cat nor bird. As Pombo hesitated, chilly with fear, he heard those voices grow louder in Lonely House, and at that he stealthily moved a few steps lower and then rushed past the beast. The beast intently watched Maharian hurling up bubbles that are every one a season of spring in unknown constellations, calling the swallows home to unimagined fields, watched him without even turning to look at Pombo, and saw him drop into the Linlun Larna, the river that rises at the edge of the world, the golden pollen that sweetens the tide of the river and is carried away from the world to be a joy to the stars. And there before Pombo was the little disreputable god who cares nothing for etiquette and will answer prayers that are refused by all the respectable idols. And whether the view of him at last excited Pombo's eagerness, or whether his need was greater than he could bear that it drove him so swiftly downstairs, or whether, as is most likely, he ran too fast past the beast, I do not know and does not matter to Pombo. But at any rate, he could not stop, as he had designed, in an attitude of prayer at the feet of Doth, but ran on past him down the narrowing steps, clutching at smooth, bare rocks, till he fell from the world, as, when our hearts miss a beat, we fall in dreams and wake up with a dreadful jolt. But there was no waking up for Pombo, who still fell on toward the incurious stars, and his fate is even one with the fate of Slith. The best sentence in this story is, On drizzly evenings of November's worst, his haggard face could be seen in the glow of some shop pressed close against the glass where he would supplicate some calm, cross-legged idol till policemen moved him on. It's such an incredibly evocative image and one of the most powerful moments in the story. 
I also love the passage where the god Maharian is blowing bubbles into the ether, and each one is springtime on some unknown world, and sprinkling the pollen of joy into the river at the edge of the universe. It's just amazing to combine these images of beauty and happiness with all the chaos and horror of this world beyond the world, and this god of springtime and abundance with the terrible beast that is its high priest. With the final sentence of this story, we kind of discover that it's a sequel to a different Dunsany story that is already on the channel, The Probable Adventure of Three Literary Men, which I will link to in the description. To be honest, it's a slightly unfortunate ending because it assumes you've read the other story and know who Slith is and what happened to him. Without that context, just throwing the word Slith in at the end of the story makes no sense. If you haven't heard that story yet, here is his fate. No spoilers. He, quote, leapt over the edge of the world and is falling from a still through the unreverberate blackness of the abyss. End quote. It's actually a really interesting connection because that story takes place entirely in a fantasy world, while this one takes place mostly in London. And yet both stories imply that beyond everything in the world is a universe of gods and magic, and beyond that is chaos, and beyond that is the abyss. And that the crazy, or devoted, or desperate can slip across those borders, and that some have gone and returned, describing the things they found there. The story, of course, also raises the persistent question of what was Pombo's prayer? The request that started out small but necessary, something he expected to have answered right away. Somehow it grew in importance and became more and more desperate. Or did it? Like, did his need eventually become so frantic and desperate that it drove him beyond the edge of the world? Or did he catch some other kind of madness, some other kind of frenzy from all of the unrequited supplication? If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. This week's confession is that I think Dunsany gets polytheism wrong here, and wrong in a way that a lot of people get it wrong. Of course, not all polytheistic religions are the same, but this story makes some oblique references that makes me think he's referring to some form of South Asian Buddhism or something like that. Dunsany also has lots of stories that discuss various gods and their relationships to each other, and always kind of in this way, where the gods have these social relationships that include etiquette and jealousy and competition. I am not a religious scholar, but my understanding of some forms of Hinduism and Buddhism, at least, is that it is actually very different. As I understand it, many Buddhists and Hindus believe that there is a single God, if you will, an all-powerful, omnipresent, omniscient entity that is one with the self and one with all things, and also greater than the self and greater than all things. And because the ordinary human mind cannot understand or relate to this greater transcendent sentience, it is instead sort of broken into fragments, and it relates back to ordinary people through the presence and powers and aspects of hundreds or thousands of individual gods or idols. In other words, all the individual Hindu gods are simply aspects and fragments of this single, greater sentience, made smaller and more comprehensible in order to give us a pathway toward this larger truth. In a small way, it's like a normal human life, where you are perhaps a parent to some people and a competitor to others, a servant sometimes, and a commander and a lover and a warrior, and we can all be all of those things in different ways at different times. The universal principle, the great God, is like that, but of course, more and greater. If that conception is correct, of course, there can't really be competition or jealousy between different gods, because there really aren't different gods at all. And you can approach idols and temples or sunsets and wildflowers with that same reverence. And I admit I'm probably overthinking it here. Dunsany tells these kind of stories because they're interesting, and because talking about gods gives the imagination more room to expand. He's not really saying anything about the actual nature of belief or religion. But I've been pretty immersed in his work lately, and this particular presentation of polytheism is pervasive, so I have to, you know, pick at it a little bit. 
If you like weird stories and old gods, you should subscribe to this channel. At Restored Lore, I find old, obscure, interesting stories, and I share them with you every week. Lately, it's even been twice a week sometimes. So please subscribe to the channel and choose notifications so you don't miss anything. And please also like this video and drop me a comment below. It's super interesting to find out what you guys think and what you're reacting to, and it does help other people find the channel and keeps it growing. Thank you so much for all the support, and I will see you next week.